But once again, welcome, especially those joining us online and to our, our brothers and sisters at our South Street campus and at the North Aurora campus. Some of you were supposed to hear from Pastor Brian Coffey this morning, uh, but uh, just as a way of a family, church family announcement, Pastor Brian uh, called me la- last night and was uh, hurrying to Ohio to see his dad before his dad passed from this life to the next. And in fact, Brian's dad, uh, Roland Coffey, did pass to be with Jesus. And he was able to get there by God's grace to be even for a few hours with him. So our prayers are with the Coffey family in this time. Uh, but glad that you're all joining us online. Let's pray and ask God to speak to us through his word. Father in heaven, thank you for your faithfulness to us, even when we are unfaithful, forgetful, and wayward in relationship to you. You, you never change. Steadfast, immovable, always faithful. And we desperately need that. And we ask you now to speak to us from your unchanging word. We who live in a world that feels like it changes every moment of every day. Like our culture is shifting sand. We're trying to find our footing and we turn to you and to your word, which is solid ground. So speak to us through it, we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. I mentioned Pastor Brian's father passing away. If you knew Brian and he talked about his dad role and his influence on his life as a pastor and as a father, a man who lived, not perfectly, but certainly as an example of what it means to live by faith, stood on this stage yesterday, uh, early afternoon, to preside over a funeral for a dear friend, member of our church, who died from ALS too soon. And then Friday, the day before, did her mother's funeral, who died at 93 years old. All three of these individuals lived by faith. And that's the heart of the series we're going to launch into now for our summer. By faith. A study of Hebrews chapter 11. And throughout the summer, we're going to look at these, because what Hebrews 11 does is give us a a framework for what faith is, not by a definition. It gives that very briefly, which we'll talk about today. But it gives us examples. Because faith is uh, harder to define, but easier to describe. You know it when you see it, when you experience it, when you taste it. And so throughout the summer, we're going to look at these uh, saints of the Old Testament who uh, lived by faith. Each week, we'll look at one of their lives and what we can learn from it in our context today. The Bible is an honest book. It's honest about the brokenness of the world. We talked about that in our last series from Romans chapter 8. What's wrong with the world, how it got that way. It's also honest about the brokenness in each of us. And so these characters we're going to look at are certainly not perfect people. There's only one perfect example. But they're, they're flawed individuals who screwed stuff up and got it wrong, and yet lived by faith. And that ought to give us, that alone ought to give us some hope and some encouragement. And these individuals, sometimes this, this chapter is called the Hall of Faith. So strap in this summer because I think it's going to be a great ride as we look through these stories and these examples. We all need examples in our faith. This morning we're going to deal with, there's two questions I think Hebrews 11 deals with. One is the question, what, what is faith? The second is, what, what does faith do? What does faith look like? We're going to deal with the first question this morning. But I mean really, what is faith? Turn to your neighbor, and in just a couple sentences, give a definition of faith. That's what I thought. <laughs> like, uh, well, wait till he says it, right? <laughs> It's, it's, if, you, if you stop and try to define it, what is it exactly? I mean, you, how do you capture it? We're going to do our best based on the first three verses of Hebrews chapter 11. But before we do, we need to say, we're, we're looking at one chapter this series, and we looked at one chapter last series, but Hebrews 11 is not something you can extract from the rest of a letter. Hebrews as a whole is a letter written to Jewish Christian, hence the term Hebrews, living in the Roman Empire, probably mostly in and around the city of Rome, but the Roman Empire in general. Under a time when there were protections of, in Roman Empire if you were a, a, if you were a Jew, if you were Hebrew, a Jew, follower of Judaism. But there were not protections if you were a follower of this sect of Judaism called Christianity. In fact, persecution for Christians was growing and intensifying. 
And so what's happening is these Jewish converts to faith in Jesus, under pressure from the Roman Empire, were thinking about reverting back to the Old Covenant. Like maybe this Jesus thing isn't worth it. People are, are getting arrested, tortured, and dying for this. Maybe we should go back to our old way, the Old Covenant, our, our, our practice of Judaism. And the writer of Hebrews, who we don't know, he doesn't identify himself, we're not sure who wrote it. Some say the Apostle Paul, that seems somewhat unlikely, we don't know for sure. But the writer is writing to faithful Christians who were Jewish converts to faith in Jesus, saying, don't fall back. Because Jesus is preeminent, he's supreme, he's better, he is the fulfillment of all that you believed, the old covenant. He's what it's all been pointing to. So don't give up and don't fall back. So as a way to start, before we get into chapter 11, let's read the last few verses of chapter 10. How does chapter 10 wrap up? It gives us some perspective or some context here. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 36 through 39. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For, and here he quotes from the prophet Habakkuk, yet a little while and the coming one will come and, not de- and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. So these lines here, you have need of endurance or perseverance. This is necessary. You need this, in other words. And they were like, they're like, yeah, we know. Life is hard. There's a lot of pressure, opposition. You have need of endurance. The coming one, who's that? Even if you're not a Bible scholar, you could probably get this one right. It's the church answer. Huh? Jesus is the coming one, the one who is coming. He will come. He will not delay. He's on his way. Live with it as if he's, his arrival is imminent. And my righteous ones, the people of God, Israel, Hebrews, Gentile converts to Christianity, all those who are faithful to God in Christ, will live by faith, he says. We're the ones who don't shrink back, but who live by faith and persevere. Okay, now let's read Hebrews 11, 1 through 3, with that as context. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. It's amazing how much is packed into three verses. So whatever faith is, apparently it's pretty important. The the heroes of old were commended for it. We need it to persevere and to endure in this life. We're supposed to live by it. But what is it? One more verse, Hebrews 11, 6, tells us this. And without faith, it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists, and he rewards those who seek him. So we need faith. Can't please God without it, can't persevere without it, can't live without it. So let's talk about what faith is. We'll talk about what faith is, what faith does, and what faith reveals. First, what faith is. Okay, before we talk about what faith is, we should be clear about what faith is not. There are, this is one of those words, like love, that just, it's used so, uh, it's used and misused so often in our culture that I think we've lost a sense of what, it's almost meaningless. Faith in your fellow man, faith in the fact that the, the Cubs farm system is good, right? Like, what does faith mean? What, what is it exactly? We use it all kinds of ways. So a few things faith is not. Faith is not blind optimism or blind faith. It's not believing something in spite of the evidence. Not just shutting your eyes and saying, I'm just going to convince myself this is true, even though I pretty much know it's not. Second, faith is not manufactured hope. You're not mustering it up. You're not making it up. It's not coming from within you. Faith is not merely intellectual agreement. Third, this is a common misconception that in in, in Western thought, rational Western thought, post-enlightenment thought, faith is intellectual agreement with these presuppositions. 
It's much more than that. Fourth, faith is not irrational or anti-reason. In other words, it's not, it's not believing something you know is not true or in spite of the evidence. Biblical faith is not believing in your heart what your mind knows to be untrue. It's not trusting or believing in something for which you have no evidence. It's not like an existential leap we call it like the leap of faith. Like, this doesn't make any sense, but I'm going to leap. We tend to think that way. In fact, when you read the definition, faith is the, the assurance of things hoped for and the confidence of things not seen. It reads almost to our, to, in English like it's something I muster up. It's a mental state I get myself into. That's not biblical faith. It's not at all what, what the writer of Hebrews is saying to us. Atheist uh, philosopher Christian, Christopher Hitchens, before he passed away, wrote a book called God is Not Great, Why Religion Poisons Everything. This may sound strange, but I recommend you read it. Not because I think he's right, because I think it's good to interact with these, these ideas in the world. It's good to challenge ourselves. What do I believe and why? Is my faith strong enough to, to be challenged in this way? Here's what he writes. Faith is the surrender of the mind. It is the surrender of reason. It is the surrender of the only thing that separates us from other mammals. Hitchens, an atheist and, and, and what they call one of the new atheists who was aggressive against Christianity, saw uh, Christian faith in particular, but religion in general, as uh, antithetical to reason, to rational thought. Part of the problem in the world. Christian faith, according to the book of Hebrews, is not irrational. It's not fantasy. It's not sentimental optimism. It is relational trust and confidence in a God who you have good reason to believe. That'll be at the heart of the series as we go through each week. Back to verse 1, Hebrews 11, 1. Uh, two different translations. Typically, I read and preach in the English Standard Version, though there's lots of good English translations. We don't exclusively use the ESV. But I want you to see the King James Version here because these words are very, very helpful for us. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Here's how the King James puts it. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Does that strike you as not just different words, but almost different meaning? Assurance and substance? Conviction and evidence. There's two different Greek words here. The Greek word here for assurance is the word Upostasis. And it's translated assurance here and substance here, which sounds different. It actually comes from, it's used in ancient Greek literature outside the Bible, uh, often in, in relation to property ownership documents, evidence of ownership, proof that this belongs to this person. You start to get the picture? The writer of Hebrews says, faith is the assurance. Not assurance based on something you just make up. But that's based on substance. There's something behind it. There's something tangible and real that it's based on. It's evidence of something. It's proof of something. And the second word is the word, Greek word, elenkos. Which has to do with confidence. Even the word, English word confidence, con, with, Fide, faith. With confidence means with faith. And this has to do with like how we respond to the substance and the assurance that we have. And it's translated conviction and evidence. Based on what we know to be true for good reason, we have conviction which leads to action. We're going to unpack that as we go. So faith's not a mental state you get yourself into. It's not something you just muster up and decide, I'm going to believe this. It is based on something. It has substance and evidence which leads to conviction, confidence, and action. Because when you read through the book of Hebrews, all these people lived by faith, and what they're commended for is not just their belief, but what they did, how they lived. You cannot separate intellectual belief from obedience and action. 
in God's economy of faith. They're, they're connected, part of a whole. So, let me put it this way. Faith is, is living as if God were telling you the truth. Living as if God is telling the truth. It begins with reason, and it leads to action. In verse 11, we, I'm skipping ahead a little bit here, but in verse 11, Sarah, Abraham's wife, Sarah, it says, considered him faithful who had promised. That word consider is a Greek word that means to think rightly about. And then in verse 19, Abraham considered, same word, that God was able even to raise the dead. Moses considered the, the, re, the reproach of Christ greater than all the wealth of Egypt. The point is they're considering, they're thinking rightly. They're, they're basing their life and their actions on what makes sense and is rational, and then they act on it. Despite what the culture says. That's much closer to biblical faith than just like, oh, okay, I'm gonna believe it. All of these individuals were thinking, reasoning, considering that God is faithful, that he's true, and that he is trustworthy, and you can base your life on him. Okay, let's talk about what faith does. We'll, we'll come back more to what faith is, but what does faith do? What, what does it produce in us? One of the things you notice, as I said, is that these belief and obedience are connected in these, these heroes of faith in Hebrews 11. Faith is a transfer of trust, which requires obedience. It's, it's not faith, uh, as James tells us brilliantly in his epistle, unless you do something with it. A simple example, which you've probably seen and many of you understand, but I'm going to ask Jesse to come up here. He, I told him ahead of time. He was a little nervous, but I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, Jesse. Jesse, do you believe that I'm strong enough to catch you if you were to fall backwards? Yes. You do? Yeah. Tell it for the crowd. Yes. You good? Okay. All right. Turn around and face the office away from me. Put your hands across your chest. Are you sure you believe I'll catch you? Yep. Do you believe that I'm I'm not uh, mean and I might just play a trick on you and let you fall? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Prove it. <laughs> See? Yeah. Let's give a hand for Jesse. <laughs> This is why I so badly wanted to drop him. <laughs> now, that's obvious. We've done it before. I was going to have him do it off the stage, but that seemed crazy. You can say it all you want, right? And, and many of us show up to church. We read the Bible. We say we believe these things, but we don't. Like, when is the testing point? Where's the proving ground of faith? In your life, in obedience. When it costs you something. I recently heard a sermon. I went out to a conference about uh, the, 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 uh, the conference was dealing with the issues in our culture that are attacking uh, the, the Christian worldview, in particular sexuality, gender, and these kinds of things. Jackie Hill Perry, who wrote a, book, a brilliant book called Gay Girl, Good God, about her journey of faith to trust in Christ. She's an African-American brilliant thinker and a great speaker. She said this, the, Hebrews of, the, 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 the heroes of Hebrews 11 to follow God, it cost them something. Faith, in their context, always involved a risk. It always involved putting themselves out there. There's no faith that doesn't involve that some, some level of cost. Reputationally, culturally, even as we'll see physically. Otherwise, just intellectual agreement. And my... my Observation is too many of us in American churches have reduced our faith to intellectual agreement. Yep, I agree, mostly. But does not translate into my life, how I live, putting myself out there, as it were. So look at what faith does. Romans chapter 1, verse 5 puts it this way. Through whom we have received grace, apostleship, to bring about the obedience of faith. This phrase, obedience of faith, for the sake of his name among all the nations. And again, Paul says later in Romans 16, at the end of the chapter, end of the book, but now has been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. What is that? 
It's exactly what the Hebrew of Hebrews is saying when these people lived by faith. Faith is assurance of things hoped for, confidence of things not seen, so that I would obey. I would live differently. This is precisely what we see in their lives. In verse 8, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going. We're going to get there in a couple weeks. Abraham's example for us is that he went out not knowing where he was going. He followed God without knowing how this is all going to work out. That's faith. I don't know about you, but I would like to do the cost-benefit analysis, wouldn't you? I'd like to be able to weigh. Well, tell me how this will play out, God. And then let me stack it up against my plan for my life, and I'll make the choice. That's not faith. God says to Abraham, go. Abraham says, where? God says, I'll tell you later. God says to Abraham, you know, follow. God says, what? Abraham says, why? I'll tell you later. C.S. Lewis writes, to have faith in Christ means, of course, to trying to do all that he says. There'd be no sense in saying you trusted a person if you did not take his or her advice. Thus, if you've really handed yourself over to him, it must follow that you're trying to obey him. And again, doesn't mean you perfectly obey him. Doesn't mean you screw up, don't screw up or you don't falter, you don't stumble. It means your faith is producing something in your life. What does faith do? It produces obedient people. People who walk and live by faith. I'll put it this way. Faith makes it possible for us to experience here and now what we hope for in the future. Faith, not just intellectual belief, but action, obedience, those two things combined, make it possible for you to experience in your life right now what you hope for in the future. What is it we hope for? That Christ will return? That he will recreate all things? That he'll restore all things? He'll right every wrong? He'll judge the world in perfect righteousness and holiness? We'll dwell with him forever? Those are future hopes based on the word of God, and you can experience tastes of his presence, his goodness, his restoring work, his perfect judgment in your life now by faith. Not just if you intellectually agree with some presuppositions, but if you take a step of faith. If you begin to align your life. There's a story told of a missionary named uh, John Patton. John Patton lived in the mid-1800s, and he uh, grew up in Scotland, uh, the Hebrides Island. He lived in the Hebrides Islands or near them, and he had a call to go to New Hebrides, which is in the South Pacific, as a missionary. Like it, God gave him this sense, this is what I want you to do, to preach the gospel, to translate my word into their languages, which didn't even have an alphabet at the time, and give your life to this work. And so he did. His wife died while he was a missionary there. His, his son, five years old, died while he was a missionary there. He came home uh, to recover for a while, went back to a different, one of the same islands in the region. Spent his entire life, over 35 years, translating the Bible, preaching the gospel to these people living in the South Pacific. And he tells the story about he's translating the book of Hebrews, and he's trying to, they didn't have a word in their culture for faith. Or trust. Their, their history was cannibalism. Nobody trusted each other, these different tribes. It was, like in, it was like built into their culture, distrust, deceit. And he's trying to figure out what word he would use. And he couldn't, he didn't, there wasn't one that he knew from their culture. A man that had become, become a Christian who was from the islands was with him and they were talking it through and he, he, they, they couldn't come up with the word and then Patton said, well, what am I doing now? He sat down in his chair and he leaned, he sat down in his chair and the guy said, he used the word for sit. And then he said, now what am I doing? And he leaned all the way back, balancing on those back two legs. And the guy used a word from their language, tribal language, which meant to put your full weight on. That's the word. That became the word that they translated trust and faith in that translation of the Bible. They had a word in their culture that meant to place your full weight on. 
That's what it means. So let's make this less of an academic exercise for a minute. What does it mean for you to place your full weight on Jesus? I almost dropped Jesse a moment ago. Do you believe he'll drop you? What does it mean for you to lay back your full weight onto the only one who can hold you? To trust him completely with all of your finances, with the future of your children, with your business, with your marriage, with your past, with your present, with your future, all of it on him. Most of us, if we're honest, will place some things. You can have this, Jesus, but I think I'd better hold on to this one. To lean back fully onto him. If you get nothing else, that image leave here with, that's what it means to live by faith. And as we do that, increasingly lean back in, onto him who can hold us. He gives us the faith to obey, to walk in faith. And as we do that, we find him faithful. And the whole thing grows, you see. That's what it means to grow in faith. Growing in faith doesn't mean knowing more stuff. People often say to me, Pastor, I want deeper teaching. And what they mean by that is, tell me something I've never heard before. Can I tell you something? You don't need stuff you've never heard before. You already know enough. What you need is to trust and believe and obey the stuff you already know. Here. That's what most of us need. Well, some of you need new stuff, but most of us need to believe what God has already said. So faith's not an additive to your life. You need a little faith. Have a little faith. It's your life. If you're a follower of Jesus, it's your whole life. And as you place your full weight on him, you find him faithful. Last, what faith reveals what faith reveals. Notice how verse one uses language about what we hope for and what we don't see. He says, faith is confidence or substance of what we hope for. That's future oriented. We talked about that already. And it's the conviction of things we do not see now. So faith not only is future oriented, it's it's located in the present. It helps us see things. Again, C.S. Lewis famously said, I believe in Christianity as I believe the sun has risen. Not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. It changes the way I see myself and the world. Now, I'm not talking about some sort of like magic Harry Potter glasses where you put on the glass of faith and, oh, I see stuff that you people can't see. Um, It's not secret knowledge. It's being able to see what's real in a culture that's clouded, full of half-truths and and unrealities and misperceptions. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 7, therefore we are always confident, although we know that while we're at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. Meaning, what he means is living in this life means we're not experiencing the total fullness of what is to come. He says, for this life we walk by faith, not by sight. He doesn't mean we're blind. He means we see differently. The writer of Hebrews gives us a great example of what this reveals in verse 3. Look at verse 3. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Pause there. This is a brilliant sentence. By faith, we believe the universe came into existence out of nothing. The Latin phrase for that is ex nihilo, comes from nothing. That God created all that exists, and he didn't need any raw material to do it. He only needed the power of his word. Stephen Hawking, who died in 2018, a famous physicist, uh, and uh, and, um, there was a 2014 documentary about his life called The Theory of Everything. Anybody seen that movie? Theory of Everything. So this was the phrase is taken from Hawking's life quest, which was to find one comprehensive mathematical physical theory of the universe that could encompass uh, and, and, and account for the theory of relativity from Albert Einstein, the, uh, the, the developments in quantum physics and quantum mechanics of the universe, uh, particle theory, uh, string theory, gravity, all these things which some reconcile but some don't. He was, his, his life's journey was to find the theory that brought them all together and made sense of the universe. 
Einstein said, I, did, I want to know the thoughts of God, not because he believed in God the way you and I do necessarily, because he was using that as a euphemism for understanding how the universe works and why it came to be. Hawking, a vowed atheist, said, we don't need God. I'm on a quest to find a theory that explains the origins of the universe and how it all operates without the necess necessity of a God. And he died in 2018. I think he probably understands things differently now. The scripture tells us what is the theory of everything. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He spoke and things happened. The word of God has already given us the theory of everything. It's the ultimate underlying reality that holds all things together. God. Psalm 33, verse six. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and by the breath of his mouth, all their host. Colossians chapter one, verses 16 through 17 puts it this way. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him, all things what? Hold together the theory of everything. Science cannot tell us why anything exists, but it has uncovered lots of realities that exist that point to the existence of God. Unless you've already predetermined he can't be part of the equation. So faith is not irrational. God's revelation of himself in the book of creation, the natural world, and his revelation of himself in Christ, his written word, the Bible, actually beautifully coincide. They're not in conflict with each other. Rightly interpreted. Rightly understood. And, and here the writer of Hebrews is saying to these Jewish believers who are tempted to fall back, you already believe that God made the world from nothing by the power of his word. And the evidence is pointing to that. Romans chapter 1, verses 19 through 20. God's invisible qualities, his divine nature have been on display through in the natural world, through what's been made. So that all people are without excuse. Psalm 19, right? The heavens declare the glory of God. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Na nature is shouting to us about the reality of God. You already believe God did this. So, and, and you are, you and I, his point is, are living in a world that is itself evidence that God exists. And if God made the world from nothing by the power of his word, then we live by faith that he will one day remake it and us. I don't know if you ever thought that way. Every, you ever watch the documentaries, The Blue Planet, Our Planet, whatever planet, there's a thousand of these on Netflix, right? They're amazing, these documentaries about our, our planet. Every time you watch those things, you should be praising God. I'm living in a world full of evidence of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Where did this world come from? Why does it exist? The writer of Hebrews says, you already believe this. Don't shrink back from the only one who's strong enough to hold you. Put your full weight on him. Last, verses 13 through 16. These all died in faith, those who came before, he's talking about. We'll get to this later, just a little precursor here. Not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. This, you see what he's doing here? Like there's, a, there's a hidden meaning here. These Hebrew Christians want to return to their old life but God is calling them to faith in Christ. And he's saying, your ancestors, the ones you revere, understood this. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. You're gonna hear this language over and over again in Hebrews 11. Here's the point. They and we are living in this in-between time. They were living looking forward to Christ's first coming. We are living looking forward to his second coming. But all of us are looking back at what God has done in the past and looking forward to what we trust he will do. And that's what it means to live by faith. It makes our future hope real and it makes his presence, his power, real now. That you get a taste of it, that you see it. Never 
faith, Frederick Buechner in his book, The Alphabet of Grace, says the opposite of faith is not doubt. Everybody's got questions. The opposite of faith is fear. I think he's exactly right. Faith doesn't mean I never have another question. I got lots of questions. Do you? I got more questions than I could answer. But don't give up what you know for what you don't know. That's foolishness. What do we know? I know who God is. I know what he has done. I know what he's done through his son, Jesus. And it's enough for me to live by faith and trusting in what he will do someday and right now. What, the, what our culture needs is more Christians living by faith. Not by fear, not by anger, not by resentment, not by you know, protests, not by Facebook posts, but by faith. Faith is the, the assurance of what we hope for and the deep conviction of things we don't yet see, which leads us to obedience now. I used Jesse a moment ago, but there's a little boy named Eli, Eli Miller, and, and his our favorite little trick where he would sit in the front row and after the service he'd come up on stage and he'd go way back there by the drum set, get down in a stance and he'd run full speed off the, off the stage and jump into my arms and I'd catch him. He's too big now. His mother said, we no longer do that. Right? <laughs> but I would walk away from those mornings thinking, that's exactly it. Put your full weight on the one who spoke the world into existence who came into this world to die for your sin, who conquered the grave, who's the right hand of the Father interceding for you even now. We studied all that back in Romans chapter eight. Put the full weight of your whole life on him and obey and let him do the rest. Let's pray. God, I I confess that my words are insufficient and we've only scratched the surface of what it means to live by faith and We're asking for your spirit and your grace to help us as we journey through this summer to understand, not just intellectually, but to live differently because of our deep conviction and assurance of who you are. Lord, we're all putting our weight on something and someone. And everything else in this world will will let us fall. Only you can hold us. Help us, Lord, to learn to live by faith because you are faithful. We pray in your name. Amen. This is our story and our song. To live by faith in the God who loved us and gave himself for us. If you're here this morning, we'd like someone to pray with you. Members of the prayer team are in the glass room as we are every, every morning. We'd love to meet with you and encourage you through prayer. Brothers and sisters, go now in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the only one who is able to hold the full weight of your life. May you lean into him every day that he gives you breath. Amen. And go in peace.